Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. In this episode, I'll be presenting a tour of early consumer computing devices, but I won't be showing you catalog pages or screenshots, but rather devices that I have in my own collection and that we can see, uh, see at work. Now, computers crept into our lives, but that isn't really true. They didn't creep into our lives. They kind of fell upon us starting in the mid-70s, mid to late 70s. Of course, the more famous ones were the uh, introduction of the PC, which included the uh, Radio Shack computers, Apples, Ataris, and a slew of other ones. But those were still kind of pricey at that time. They opened the door for a lot of people. The manufacturers were trying hard to get them into businesses. So, uh, price uh, sensitivity wasn't really something that, that the manufacturers of fully-fledged home computers were, uh, were very interested in. However, what we're going to talk about today are the devices that were cheaper than a full computer and really opened up the world of computing to a lot of people, a lot more people that could afford or were interested into getting a home computer. What you're seeing below here is an example of a uh, late 70s computer that wasn't a consumer device, but rather powered a consumer appliance. But it's a good example of how computers took over to controlling appliances in, in the mid to late 70s. Now, this particular device was made by Gottlieb, which makes amusement machines, and uh, it powered some of their arcade games and pinball machines. The most famous arcade game that used this is probably Qbert, where uh, you can hear Qbert speak in a somewhat mechanical voice, and that was all done by this board, which is a uh, fully fledged 6502 single board computer that uh, has an A to D, a uh, phonetic speech synthesizer, and uh, generated all of the noise that came out of the speaker. However, this of course is not a consumer device and uh, thus is not really relevant to today's episode. But, you know, the people who came out with the home computers get all of the glory. But the people who are working behind the scenes, who are designing these kinds of boards, which really weren't that far from the home computers, except of course they didn't have a raster display circuitry or keyboards or anything like that. But technology was marking was marching on on two fronts and one these came from the hidden front, whereas computers and the other devices we'll be talking about were out in the open. First on our list is the granddaddy of all calculators here, an example of it at least. This uh, is an Aristo 0906LL Biscaller slide rule. And I'm sure you've seen some of these. These are also called slip sticks because the center of it moves. And uh, the operation of these is uh, based on logarithms. They make it uh, relatively easy for you to multiply and divide two numbers by uh, setting them up on uh, on the markings on the ruler and uh, going through some gyrations to get the result. One of the main things that uh, was difficult here was there's obviously a finite number of markings and your numbers wouldn't always match exactly. So what you had to do was take two readings, one below the actual value and one above the actual value, write it all down and then interpolate on paper to get an exact answer. It was still better than paper and pencil, and uh, basically what this is, it's a mechanical analog computer that was invented in the 17th century. does look like a ruler, but it isn't, and uh, these pretty much disappeared, uh, what was it, in 1974, when uh, the first uh, electronic calculators appeared, and they pretty much became useless overnight. There were special purpose ones made for this, especially for uh, 
for marine uh, navigation and stuff like that. And it is says that some uh, sailors still have one of these handy in their kit just in case because the one and only advantage of this is, is it doesn't use any power. All you need is a modicum of uh, ambient light and somewhat good eyesight and you can do a whole bunch of calculations with this. And uh, it becomes easier. I mean, it may look really complicated, but it does become easier with practice. And uh, But again, uh, nowadays it is not exactly something that is really, really, really useful. Even as a marking for pi over here. And uh, let's see if we can get closer to that. Pi, where are you? There you go. It's got a specific marking for pi right here, so go ahead and figure out all of your uh, circle calculations with this thing. But again, this is a this is of historical value only, and uh, on, uh, unlike uh, I mean I don't know if it's true that sailors actually carry these around, but nowadays only collectors, the majority only collectors have these and. Uh, but this is uh, this is the predecessor to what comes next. Here we have a prime example of what puts slide rules out of business. It's one of the first mass-produced electronic calculators. It's a Casio Mini, model number CN-605, which appeared in 1974 and was sold in that year only. It has a uh, six-digit display, and uh, one of the oddities is is that it uses, for lack of a better expression, a lowercase zero. As you can see, the other numbers are all a regular seven-segment size, but for some reason the zero was made uh, to look like that. And. Uh, Probably a cost consideration or you know special design of, of the VFD, but but anyway, that that was one of the first calculators, and I'm sure that people who were used to using slide rules really welcomed this. Now it's not very fast. I mean, it's it's fast, but you can actually see it think. So let's multiply this by something, and if we watch the display, we can see it work. And uh, the uh, processing time is uh, is not constant. It depends on uh, the operands and, of course, the operators used with it. With that in mind, uh, some may argue that this isn't really a computing, a, a consumer computing device. But uh, I say it is because you can enter an infinite string of uh, operands and operators. And thus, even though it can't uh, store programming steps, it is a real-time programmable consumer device. This particular example is in excellent condition. Uh, there's no scrapes on it. There's, I mean, other than the uh, outgassing of the VFD, if it's in fact outgassing, it, I, I don't know what these look like originally. It's in really, really good shape. You can see the back. The battery cover is still there. And uh, it also came uh, with its own carry case, which we have over here. And uh, so my guess is that somebody got this for Christmas. And uh, two weeks later, the next better model came out. And so this got relegated to the closet. And the last thing we can look at this is there is a uh, design defect in this that's pretty well known, I think I saw this in another video, in that it cannot handle divide by zero. So uh, when you tell this to uh, divide by zero, then uh, so it shows you six zeros. No activity, no nothing. But that's kind of unusual, you know, to, to, to show uh, six leading zeros with uh, nothing else happening. 
However, the six leading zeros seem to indicate that there may be something else going on, that there's more precision. And there is, in fact, because if you press the special function key now, you'll see the lower six digits, and it's doing something. It's counting up. And uh, I don't know if it's doing interpolation, lookups, some kooky algorithm, whatever. But it just sits and does that. And uh, if we wait long enough, I'm sure uh, the uh, it would ripple carry through and uh, you would see the lower digit jump to a 1 and so on and so forth. But uh, you can already see that that would probably take a few lifetimes to happen. So we're not going to wait it out. Other than that, it's a very neat piece of equipment, very historical, and almost as useless as the slide rule is. But this is, or these kinds of uh, calculators are, what started the consumer revo uh, revolution. Our next item is this Science Fair microcomputer trainer. It was sold in the U.S. through Radio Shack stores. Uh, late 70s, early 80s maybe, and it was uh, it was their first attempt at uh, giving us a uh, a science kit with an actual processor in it. Radio Shack sold countless numbers of electronics experimenters kits, but I think this was the first one that actually had a processor in it. Now, other than the processor, there's really no components on here. As you can see, it's got an amplifier for the speaker that has a few things in it, LEDs and uh, a seven segment display with limiting resistors, clock circuit for the processor, the processor itself, and uh, buttons. Not really buttons, I mean they are uh, they're basically little metal springs with uh, blue tops attached to them. It was very economically uh, built this part's cardboard here. All of this is cardboard and it's got the thin uh, plastic sides. But I think that went a long way towards being able to sell this uh, relatively cheaply and does give lots of people access to it. Now there's a few interesting design choices they made here. If we have a look at the processor, I don't know how close I can get to it and still have this thing focus, but uh, it's basically house numbered, but we can see the prominent TI logo right over here. And my guess is that this is a TI, uh, a TMS 1000 uh, series processor, which really was one of the first embedded processors since it uh, consisted of uh, the processor core, it had uh, mask ROM, a small amount of RAM, and pretty much uh, all the pins were I.O. pins. So here is uh, your predecessor to today's embedded processors. And uh, what they did here was very interesting because it's running a monitor program and uh, giving you, you program it with pseudocode. Because I looked at the instructions they give you in the manual. Oh, by the way, you do get a manual. That's this here, and uh, there are a hundred experiments in there. And uh, I know that scans of that manual are available online, and this guy itself shows up once, once or not, not very often, but it does show up on eBay, and uh, for not a whole lot of money. But anyway, back to the processor. So it's running a monitor program. And you program it in the pseudo language that they give you, because when I looked at the manual and I looked at the instruction set, which is actually over here, it didn't. The instruction set didn't look anything like a TMS 1000 instruction set. So, as part of the monitor routine, they give you a limited instruction set, in which which you use to program this, write your own programs. But uh, just to get started with it, the first step they tell you is to wire it up with all these wires you see here. And what that basically does is it hooks up the clock and uh, the uh, seven segment display and the, and the LEDs and the speaker to the appropriate outputs on the uh, processor. And uh, you can go ahead and uh, run some of the built-in programs before having to do anything else. 
Now I'm going to power this off a uh, 9 volt battery. You can either put six AAAs in the bottom of it or just clip on this 9 volt battery over here. And hopefully it'll spring to life, but it did not. Oh, because I clipped it onto the wrong terminals. There you go. So uh, it came up, and I'm going to have to reference the manual here because uh, uh, things are not uh, things are not incredibly intuitive in here. But uh, let's see if something's running. Yes, as we press the keys right now, it shows us the key press, the number of the key that we've pressed by uh, pressing a key on the hex keypad. Or you can also do a binary count on the LEDs. Now that is all built in. The only thing you had to do to get this far was to wire all of this stuff correctly and uh, you were on the road to start writing your own programs. Now I won't spend a whole lot of time on, on the built-in games. I think you get the idea, but uh, the uh, first program that's built in is called the electronic organ. And uh, in order to run that, let's see, you press the reset key, then you press the number 9 key, followed by run. So now what it's supposed to do, it's got a musical note assigned to keys 1 through E. Very exciting, but uh, you can play music with it. Other things that it has uh, built in, it's there's a very simple uh, musical sequencer in there. And uh, you'll get to type in the data for Swanee River and it'll play that for you. But since this thing isn't uh, battery backed, I'm uh, not going to attempt to do that right now. They also tell you how to do Silent Night. And the Yankee Doodle. Uh, <clears throat> then they have a musical guessing game, which is basically a Simon game. Rat bashing, which is like a whack-a-mole game. A tennis game, a timer, Morse code, and on and on it goes. And once you've played through all of the built-in stuff, then we actually get in and they start giving you program listings of how to type in programs, and make and execute those to have them do various things. It's a little bit difficult because uh, you're basically using seven LEDs and the seven segment to give you feedback, like when you're checking things in memory and so on. That's it gets a bit uh, it gets a bit uh, tiresome. But other than that, this was yet another device that was access accessible to most people and probably gave them a really good idea of what it was like or what it would take to program a uh, program a microcomputer the instruction set which we'll have a look at now is uh, here and as i said before these are all pseudo instructions these aren't <clears throat> actual uh, tms 1000 instructions but uh, i guess you type those in i mean this thing has uh, 32 or 64 bytes of RAM, so you type that in and when you hit run it goes in and uh, interprets those instructions and does wild and crazy things for you. And what people did was they used to interface this actually to other experimenter kits that Radio Shack sold or others sold and ran wires across it and and that this was uh, this was their computer system. Some people actually learned the principles of computer programming on something like this. And with that, we come to the third and last computing device in this episode. And this is probably, by far, 
the better known of all, th of, of all three shown here. It's the MOS Technology KIM-1 user manual for the KIM-1 itself, which uh, was a, a development experimenters board for the 6502. Now when this came out, processors still cost a lot of money. I mean, even 8031s, Intel 8031s were still several hundred dollars. And uh, one uh, coup that MOS Technology pulled was uh, they sold the 6502 for $25. <clears throat> it would seem like an obvious marketing strategy, but uh, the, uh, the results of, of selling them so cheaply are usually not good for the financial health of a company. However, they did pull it through because uh, they sold it that cheaply. I think it's one of the main reasons why the 6502 landed in many thousands of Apple II computers. And I think that more than made up for the uh, price drop that they, uh, that they had to implement. Anyway, the Kim one was pretty popular because uh, it would originally came out and it cost $245 in, a, in kit form and $500 assembled. I mean, in $500 it was encroaching upon Radio Shack computer prices already, but at $245, which was half that price, it was very cheap for a uh, fully featured 8-bit, I won't call it a development system, but an experimenter system. The one thing, of course, they didn't mention was that they'd sell you one of these either the kit or the whole thing, and before walking out the store, the salesman would go, well, what are you going to do about supplying power to it? And uh, make you pay another $40, $50 for a power supply. But uh, in the end, it was still, it was still uh, uh, one of the cheapest ways to go. Had about uh, 1K of RAM and uh, six displays. But anyway, a few years ago, I... I had seen one years ago, played with it, and I really wanted one, and I went on eBay, and uh, I came back, I got sticker shock, because uh, the ones that were being sold looked pretty crappy, and uh, they cost several hundred dollars. Now, there's one also, an aftermarket one that was recently made, you can buy the PC board, and it's slightly smaller, and but to me, it was the beginning of a weekend, and I really wanted... Uh, to play with a Kim 1. So uh, here's what I came up with. Uh, using the latest uh, in assembly techniques, I built this and uh, just so I could sit down and program it and remember my misspent youth. So let me plug power into it. Turn it on, hit the reset key, and there you go. Uh, the first, these four digits show the current address, and these show the data. Now, uh, this doesn't look anything like the original. I didn't even make a big attempt to keep it looking original. I just wanted a functional Kim One as quickly as possible. I built this almost exclusively out of parts that I already had. <clears throat> I think uh, I think the one thing the one thing I had to go to the store for was uh, have a look at this was a uh, 74 LS 145 which is a uh, BCD which is a binary to BCD converter. It's basically used as a decoder uh, instead of an LS138 or 139. But the cool thing about that chip is, is it has open collector outputs, so uh, you, can, uh, you won't need a NAND gate or any other gates. Let's say, for instance, uh, you're decoding in 8K blocks. If you, want, if you need memory space of 16K, you can simply hardwire the two appropriate outputs together, and there's your select signal. The one thing that I felt I had to add very quickly to it was battery backup. As I uh, lamented in, uh, over the Radio Shack computer trainer, 
these things are just, uh, <clears throat> it's ridiculous to have to sit there and key in programs and then the cat jumps over the power cable or something and you lose all of the work you've done. Kind of what people on Altairs had to go through. So what I did was I actually added, I mean, the things I've changed mostly are, of course, the layout. I just laid it out for convenience. <clears throat> Uh, the original had 1K and uh, I added an 8K static RAM chip to it and I battery backed it with a DS1210 non-volatile memory controller and a battery and uh, that basically takes care of everything. You don't have to worry about it monitors power for you, uh, supplies the, v, uh, the battery voltage and you also run the uh, chip select signal through here and it makes sure that on shutdown or on power up things in RAM don't get scrambled. Now I used uh, the most modern uh, construction techniques available to me on that day and uh, this entire thing is uh, wire wrapped. And, uh, yeah, I could have sat down and, and built a board and sent it out to China to have the board spun and all of that, but uh, this was more fun, and uh, and it still works. This was a few years ago when I did this, and it's been stored and thrown around a couple of times, but it's still functional, so uh, the prototyping approach was valid. The way you enter programs in here is, uh, so you set up an address first, so we press address, let's go to 0400 and uh, then you enter data by you press the data button and then you enter your data which shows up there and to go to the next location you press the plus key and you just keep repeating that and if you have an unmodified Kim hoping that the power won't fail but in my case uh, no problem because uh, whatever I type in here stays in there. Now I went online and I found a book uh, uh, listed called uh, the first book of Kim which had a bunch of programs that you got to enter in here and uh, and oh before I forget of course uh, I should point out that here's the 6502 here's the 65 uh, no this is the 6502 this is 6532 uh, which wasn't in the original Kim because the original Kim actually had uh, the uh, monitor program in a 6530, I believe it was. 6530s are complete. Well, they're on Optanium because uh, you can't, they, they don't come as EEPROM parts or anything. You can't program them. And the original 6530s with the uh, Kim monitor are nowhere to be found. So basically you put a 6532 in there that does everything the 30 did except that it doesn't have built-in ROM and then you hang an EEPROM on it and uh, everything works. Then you've got your glue logic here, uh, your RAM and your ROM and your array of buttons of course and your common anode LEDs. And that's it. Now I checked around uh, on the internet and there's something called the first book of Kim, which uh, contains uh, several programs that you can type in. And uh, now here we uh, see the benefits of uh, the battery-backed RAM because a while ago I typed in a program from that book that was called Quick. And if I check it now, it starts at uh, hex 300 and looks like it still has everything in it. I mean the first few bytes are A5F92A. Yep, it's still in there. So we set the address back to uh, 0300. And uh, so what this is, is a, uh, it's one of the shorter programs, that's why I entered it. It's a reaction tester. You basically start running it, the display goes blank. Uh, your finger hovers over the keyboard and the minute the display lights up, you have to press the key as fast as possible. Now the display lights up with a counter. So when you press the key, the counter stops and it's telling you how long it took for you to react. And the way it works is uh, we go, we press the uh, go key 
and uh, wait for it to start counting and then hit it really late. And it tells me that after that it took me 90 glip checks to or whatever. I mean, that's the, 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 the time isn't quantized to anything real, but uh, it, it just basically gives you a comparative countdown. So if you're using this as a party game or so, the number doesn't have any absolute meaning, meaning, but you know, you use it to relatively determine who's the fastest reactor in your group. And you can keep playing it by keep hitting the uh, go key and uh, staring at it. It's a random delay. See, this time I did even better. And normally, of course, what you can do is you can just let it run. So that way you can actually see it count. All right. Now, this can be expanded further. You can add another uh, 6532 uh, to get more I.O. out of it. You can add a speaker to it. And uh, it actually, oh yes, and you can hook it up to a cassette player to save and load your programs. But uh, uh, with the large amount of memory and the backup I have, I won't be needing a tape player for this. Uh, there's also the TV typewriter board, which gave you a uh, gave you a rudimentary uh, CRT display that you could interface to this. And but the problem was that once you got into all of those expansions and so on, the uh, financial outlay required by you got very near to a ready-made PC. So I think it was a good thing to get the baseboard and learn how to program, basically write 6502 code in the beginning, hand convert it to opcodes and enter them, and then if you had access to a computer, actually use the 6502 assembler, write your programs there and put them in. And uh, it was uh, originally uh, popular with the, scientific, with the scientific community, but because of the $250 price for the kit, the hobbyist community jumped in both feet and for a time this was a very very popular uh, single board computer that you could hone that you could learn or hone your programming skills on well my final words for this episode are it was fun in the old days things were accessible you could figure them out you could modify them and nowadays everything is proprietary and the law's gotten involved and you're not supposed to reverse engineer and you're not supposed to learn and well that's just my opinion but uh, I think it was a lot easier to learn in the old days than it is now with everything closed and with that devices have gotten much better everything we have nowadays is faster and more usable and there's no argument about that, but there is one thing that I do sorely miss from the old days, and that is the openness of documentation. Right here is a technical reference for the IBM AT series of computers. This was something you could buy for $20, $25, and it basically told you everything about the computer. It goes to the system board, it explains the theory of everything that goes on in the computer. Here's the beginning of the listing of BIOS. It's all there. The entire BIOS is listed here. And it's not just listed, it's listed with comments and headers. And You can actually look in here and figure out what's going on and why certain things are going wrong or just why certain things are working or not working. And finally, there were descriptions of each of the subsystems. Here's actually a description of the 20 megabyte hard disk in the AT. Again, it's full of theory. And finally, it shows you the signals for the interface and schematics for the entire thing. Everything you could possibly want to know about the computer that you just spent a lot of money for is listed in these pages. 
I'm really sad that manufacturers don't do that anymore. But anyway, I really do hope that you enjoyed this walk through memory lane, at least partially as much as I did. And if you did, and you think it's worth a thumbs up, then uh, go ahead and click it. And if you haven't subscribed already, you probably should subscribe because there's lots more stuff like this coming up. So thanks for watching and uh, I will leave you with a short clip of a very popular VR game after this. Later. And here's Qbert. Hello, I'm Dre Dog. Yeah, it's